I understand it with my limited knowledge on the subject. Uh, estate planning, it's, it's all about uh, determining how an individual's assets will be preserved, managed, and distributed after death or in the event, or in the event that they become incapacitated. Uh, Eric uh, Carrera from Carrera Law, just down the road in Swansea, uh, has offered to come here and educate us on the subject of estate planning. So we're really, really uh, pleased that he was able to make time for us. Uh, there are at least five couples that are either in Florida or unable to attend for some reason, one reason or another, and Jerry kindly has offered to videotape this. In addition, Eric, uh, the packets that you have, he's, uh, he's offered also to email those packets to the people that are not here. And so I sent those folks uh, emails this morning asking permissions for me to give Eric their email addresses so that they can receive the information. So, uh, thank you all for coming. And please don't forget to turn your cell phones off. Okay, with that, Eric. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Carrera, and as Manny mentioned, I'm an estate planning attorney. I have offices uh, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Florida. My main office and closest office, though, is right down the street in Swansea. And um, as an estate planning attorney, we do all facets of, of estate planning, so we handle just general estate planning, we handle tax planning, uh, planning for long-term care and nursing home protection. Also, because I'm admitted in Florida, I do a lot of planning for snowbirds who maybe are spending some time in Florida and some time in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, and so we have to deal with issues on both sides. And uh, as a state planning attorney, our, our motto is that we provide large firm reach with small firm service because this is all we do is the state planning and trust in estates. Uh, don't call me if you get in a car accident. Well, you could call me for a referral, but don't call. I can't handle car accidents or divorces or anything like criminal law. It's really all just estate planning, but we stay busy because we handle uh, three different states. So today, I, what I want to do is just give a broad overview of estate planning, touching on several different areas, starting with basic estate planning, and then also tax planning, Medicaid planning, special needs planning, and the last part, which will probably be of most interest for the people that have already left, <laughs> but would be uh, state planning for real estate or assets in multiple states. Uh, at the end, though, I'll also leave time so that we can have any questions uh, you might have. We can go through and, and talk through things. And honestly, if you have a question that pops up while we're, I'm talking, feel free to, to interrupt me. It, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so let's start with the, the basics. And the next few slides, I just wanna go over what most people would call basic estate planning, which are the core documents really that anyone should have. I mean, even some of these, once a, a child turns 18, they should have a few of these documents. And uh, if someone buys real estate, gets married, these, these, are, these are sort of the, the core of any estate plan. No matter what someone does, they should have the following three documents. And I'm guessing many people here probably already have those documents, uh, hopefully anyway. So the first document is a healthcare proxy, and that's the document that you have to designate. If you can no longer make your own decisions, who you would want to make medical decisions on your behalf. In many states, most states, there's also something called a living will, which is a, you can list out what your medical wishes would be, in Massachusetts, you can sign a living will. However, technically, it's not legally binding. What's more important is having the healthcare proxy because that actually names a person. If you can't make decisions, they will make the decision in the moment depending on what's going on uh, based on the advice of the doctors and other medical professionals. And the second document is a power of attorney, which is sort of like a healthcare proxy. It's it goes into, well, it can go into effect immediately, but more often it goes into effect if you can no longer make legal and financial decisions, and that names somebody to be able to pay your bills, do your banking on one end, but actually it can, it's anything that you could do legally or financially, so that person could sell real estate or file a lawsuit on your behalf. The power of attorney gives that other person the ability to do any of those things if you can't yourself. And people say, well, why would I wanna do that? The reason is, if you have a healthcare proxy and power of attorney, you're deciding who's going to be making medical decisions and legal decisions. You pick. If you don't have those documents in Massachusetts, then if you were 
uh, deemed incapacitated, then the, whoever, the family or a friend, someone would have to go to court to be appointed your guardian, that's the medical person, and then conservator, which is the legal person. Uh, I mean, so a few downsides of that. Obviously, there's, there's costs, but also you're, you have no privacy because now if you're under what's called a conservatorship, for instance, everything about your life, your, you know, your assets and your income, it's all filed with the court, so it's all public record. And you don't have a say. I mean, you're incapacitated. You didn't designate someone, so you don't necessarily know who would be the person that would become the guardian or conservator. So having those two basic documents is very important. And those are the two documents I even tell when I have um, clients come in who have kids in like their 20s, for instance. Th those are the two documents. I don't care if they don't have any assets or you know they're just working and, and starting out in life. They really should still have those two core documents in case they get in an accident or sick unexpectedly to avoid a lot of, they're very, they're very basic documents, but they avoid a lot of headaches. And the third sort of core document that everyone should have is their will, which lays out what they would want to have happen to their assets if they pass away. Um, a will is important in the sense that there's still going to be something called probate, which is a court process to be able to move assets when one person dies to whoever they name in their will. They, they still have to go to court but it makes that process easier. And of course, it also allows uh, people to decide who gets their assets instead of defaulting to what's called intestacy, which is just the state statute for who gets assets when someone dies without a will. For younger couples, wills are important as well because you can name a guardian. So if you have minor children, you, a lot of, you know, that's the big reason younger couples would wanna do wills is to say who they would want to take care of their children if God forbid something happened to them. Uh, keep in mind though with a will, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that while people will have wills to say what they want to have with their assets, wills only control assets that are in that person's own name when they die. So anything that has a joint owner or if there's a beneficiary like a, on a retirement account or a life insurance policy, those assets are going to pass to whoever's name is on the given asset. The will would solely be for just an account in one person's name or real estate in one person's name. That's what the will would control. Okay. Sure. Uh, a will does not offer any, any kind of tax protection, is that correct? Correct. Correct. And I take it you're going to talk about that. Right. Yep. We're going to talk about trust in a few minutes. Uh, I mean, there are pro it's probably beyond this this talk, but there are ways you could use a will to maybe get some tax savings, but it's not. It's usually not part of the original plan. It's people having the ability to make some certain decisions after the fact. So those three documents, again, those are the core documents. If you go to um, if you go to any attorney to do estate planning, you should leave with at least those three things because they really are what everyone needs to have: a healthcare proxy, a power of attorney, and a will. Uh, Beyond that, then we start talking about trusts, and I'm going to, I guess I'll just preface this by saying there are all different kinds of trusts that do all different kinds of things, and there's not a one size fits all, so a lot of times people talk to a family member, they talk to a neighbor, and they say, well, I have this kind of trust, why don't you have that kind of, you know, just remember it's very specific what kind of trust, if, if you even need a trust, right, what kind of trust a person's going to have, and they may have more than one trust, so, the next few slides, I'm just going to do a general overview of trusts and, and the different general types. I want to, I'm going to spend a lot of time on something called an irrevocable trust, but before we get to that, I'll start with what's called a revocable trust, which is a, very generally, it's, a, it's almost like a super will. Um, it, it does what a will does. It, it states who you would want to be in charge if you pass away of the assets, who you would want to receive the assets. The big thing about a revocable trust versus a will is that it voids that court process called probate. So by having a revocable trust and putting your real estate and maybe some other assets in the trust, it uh, allows things to pass automatically to the beneficiaries. No one has to go to court or, or have things in the newspaper and, and, and go through that process. It's, 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 it should be anyway, much more simple and easy for whoever's been named as the beneficiaries in the trust. Um, what are some downsides of the, I don't know if there's actually downsides other than having to pay to do it, but the downsides would be the cost of setting it up. 
When you have a trust, you also then have to put things in the trust. It's sort of like a box. So a revocable trust looks nice on paper, but unless your real estate is, the ownership is changed with a deed to the trust and your accounts make the trust the owner or the beneficiary, if those steps aren't taken, then it's, it's a box that's empty. You have to put things into the box while you're living so that if something happens to you, automatically things then will flow through the box to the beneficiaries. A general sort of standalone revocable trust does avoid probate. Um, it doesn't do that much more than that. So there are other kinds of trusts that you can have for tax planning reasons or for Medicaid protection. But what we would call a, I call a revocable trust, other people would call a living trust. That kind of trust, it, um, it really doesn't do anything else besides avoid probate. I don't want to get too deep into tax uh, issues, but just to kind of give a general overview, I don't know if anyone knows in the last uh, month we had a, a new law passed in Massachusetts. So up until now, the, or for the last over 20 years, the estate tax in Massachusetts has been a million dollars or more. So anyone that has over or had over a million dollars in assets, if they passed away, there would be an estate tax on, on everything. Because it was also sort of a strange system where if you had a million dollars in assets and went over a million dollars, then they taxed everything, not just the amount over it. Uh, as part of the tax relief bill in Massachusetts that happened a few weeks ago, literally a few weeks ago, uh, the exemption has changed from a million to two million. So now you only have to worry about Massachusetts estate taxes if you have two million dollars or more in assets. In addition, the calculation is now not on if you go over two million, everything. Instead, it's only on the amounts above two million. So, th so that's been a nice change for people in Massachusetts. Of course, the reality is it's still, we went from the worst in the country for estate taxes to the third worst. So it's not as great as it all seems because most states either don't, do not have an estate tax or they um, have a much higher threshold, like $5 million before it kicks in. But still, it's, we'll take it, right? It's, it's better, it's, now we go from a million to two million. And what that means is that there's, less of a need for a lot of people to even worry, about, that's why I don't want to spend as much time on this, there's less of a need for a lot of people to even worry about estate tax planning because between having a $2 million exemption in Massachusetts and then an over $12 million exemption on the federal side, a lot of people don't have to worry about estate taxes. The most common kind of trust, however, to deal with estate taxes is what I call an AB revocable trust. It could also be called a, credit shelter, a marital credit shelter trust. It's almost like, uh, it is a revocable trust, like the one we just talked about, but it includes additional provisions so that if, this would only be for a married couple. If you're a married couple, then with the right planning in that trust, in, now that we've gone to a $2 million exemption, it allows both spouses' credits to be used, so instead $4 million can pass tax-free in Massachusetts. So now in Massachusetts, with the right trust, you can do $4 million tax-free without having to really other than getting the plan in place, have your life change. Uh, there are other kinds of tax trusts, but once you go beyond that AB revocable trust, they all involve some component of giving things away. So that, because you're gifting to get things out of your name, so if you pass away, there's no estate tax. So those are a little bit trickier for people because that's a reality of, okay, this isn't mine anymore. But just to sort of summarize them, there's things called irrevocable life insurance trusts, which are usually used for life insurance, although other assets could be used to move an insurance policy out of your name so that, you know, you can actually do it in a way where the policy is owned by the trust. Every time you pay the premium, it's a gift, but then when you pass away, the, the full value of the policy is not yours for tax purposes. Um, and then, and again, I don't want to get too deep into this, but there are other tax trusts that involve just gifting assets, moving them out of a person's name. But this is all become, becoming less and less popular because of the changes in the estate tax law, uh, basically making the estate tax not really apply to as many people as it used to. Um, the, so I, I'll stop. Does anybody have any questions about tax planning at all? What about federal? Well, the planning would be the same for federal taxes. The same, the same rules exist uh, for the Massachusetts state tax and the federal, so it's the same system, but federal estate taxes only kick in if you have $12.6 million in assets. So now going back to that AB revocable trust, um, 
I mean, you're talking about $24 million being passed tax-free without having to do anything else. So it's, things have changed a lot in the last few years. First, with the Trump administration and th those tax law changes on the federal side, they really bumped up the federal uh, estate tax. And in response, a lot of states then decided we're going to get rid of the estate tax altogether or they moved their exemptions up as well. So now in the U.S., like I said, Massachusetts, were the f it depends how you look at it, but we're the, we had the third lowest threshold at $2 million. Um, Rhode Island is at, a, it's a weird figure because it's adjusted for inflation, but it's about 1.7 million is where Rhode Island starts making people pay estate taxes. And then Oregon still has a million dollar exemption. Did the uh, irrevocable trust change with these new laws as far as like in the nursing home? You can put your assets in an irrevocable trust and the nursing home can't touch them. Is that still... That's that right. That those laws haven't changed at all, with that, because those are the Medicaid rules, uh, which I'll, I'm going to actually get into now. The, um, the the Medicaid trusts they're a little bit different. I mean, technically, a tax trust, if you put something in it, it's not yours for Medicaid purposes. But the, there's another kind of irrevocable trust where it's still yours for tax purposes, but it's not yours for Medicaid purposes. Um, so I, so I'll go, I'm going to go over the general Medicaid rules, and then I'm going to talk about how those trusts work, because they're actually a lot different than the tax one, trusts. Uh, so Medicaid planning. This actually, beyond the basic estate planning, I think is probably the, the most popular, or I shouldn't say, well, when I meet with clients, this is usually their biggest concern these days, beyond just getting something in place, is that they're concerned about the cost of long-term care, uh, because now in Massachusetts and it's a little, not as much in Rhode Island, but I mean, we're talking about, I've heard nursing homes in Massachusetts are now charging thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month to pay for the nursing home. Um, so a lot of people now have the concern, well, if something happens to me and I get sick, what I have accumulated over my lifetime from my kids or whoever else, it's going to go quickly if I have to go to a nursing home. And so what I'll do is I'm just going to go over generally the Medicaid rules and then we'll talk about how I deal with these, these kinds of issues. But when we talk, and some people say, well, I'm not on Medicaid. And, and that's right, most people when they're retired, they're not on Medicaid, they're on, they have Medicare for health insurance. But if you have to go to a nursing home, you have really two options. Either you pay for the nursing home until all that's left is $2,000, or you have planning in place so that at least a, a portion of your assets are insulated and protected so that even if you have to spend some of your money on the nursing home, at some point the state will then pick up the bill because you'll be on Medicaid. And a lot of times people just in Massachusetts say mass health, but we're talking about Medicaid. Um, and so how does this work? If you need long-term care, the state wants to know everything about what you have. So that means the money in the bank, all of your investments, cars, your real estate, they want to know what your assets are, and then they also want to know what you have coming in for income. Uh, so there's really nothing of value that a person can have that's not going to be factored into this analysis. As I mentioned, in Massachusetts, it's the same in Florida. So I always do Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Florida, because those are the three states I practice in, just to compare and contrast. But in Massachusetts and Florida, the threshold, if you want to be on Medicaid, you can have no assets left other than $2,000 in the bank. Everything else has to have been spent on, uh, the, on health costs and, and the nursing home. Rhode Island, they're a little more generous, I suppose, and they let you have $4,000 if you have to go to a nursing home. Can I ask you something? Sure. About Rhode Island. Sure. I was told that if I have to go to a nursing home someday, I want to go into Rhode Island, you know, where you're establishing your residency there, you know, you're here for the long term and they do not take as much money away. You know, they don't consider your, uh, I think it's uh, IRAs and 401ks, they leave you with more money in the bank. Yes. Of course you have to go to Rhode Island, but that's another story. Well, right, that's a, no, that's another story, but actually you are 100% right. When I meet with clients in Swansea, the first thing I say to them when, when we're talking about Medicaid is go to Rhode Island. And Rhode Island's not that far. Warren is right there. Uh, East Providence, right? We're not, it's, it's a few towns over. Um, well, since you asked, we'll talk through it. So you're right, in Rhode Island, they have much more generous rules. The, the big distinction is what you already said, which is, while in Massachusetts, they look at all of your assets, 
then they're all counted for that. You can only have $2,000 left. Rhode Island with IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, any kind of tax deferred retirement plan, they don't count that. You can actually keep your retirement. You could have a million dollars in an IRA and it's not counted in Rhode Island. And it's, it's a simple difference of moving, if, well, you would be moving, but going to a nursing home in Rhode Island as opposed to a nursing home in Massachusetts. So we're, we're talking about where we are right now in Rehoboth. We're talking about the difference between going to a nursing home in Swansea versus going to a nursing home in Warren. You could protect a million dollars just by being in Warren instead of Swansea. You have to establish Well, right, but whenever you apply for Medicaid, you, wherever you're going into the nursing home, you're saying that's your your residence, so you, you know, the nursing home would be your residence. That could have some impact on then if you have a house in, say, Massachusetts still. But generally speaking, that's, that's right, you wanna to go to a Rhode Island nursing home. Um, there's, ver there's, very, there's, there's a couple of differences that are better in Massachusetts where I've had a couple of times where Massachusetts made more sense, but for mo almost everyone, especially now, more and more people, that's where they, you know, the, the pensions, the days of everyone having pensions is gone, and, a lot of people's savings are in retirement accounts um, to be able to protect that just by going to another, for, you, for everyone here, another town. <laughs> it's, I mean, I know it's another state, but it's not that far away. It, uh, it's a huge benefit. So if you were to do that, would you have to sell your primary residence in Massachusetts before you checked into a nursing home in Florida? You would have to either sell it or show the state that you're in the process of selling it, okay? Because that's the, the, the flip side of that is that in Rhode Island, if you're in Rhode Island, now your primary residence is an out-of-state asset, so they're gonna, they'll look at that as money in the bank. So you have to show that you're trying to do something to, to sell the, um, the real estate. Technically in Massachusetts, if you go to a nursing home and you have your residence in Massachusetts and you go to a Massachusetts nursing home, you don't have to technically immediately sell your real estate. You can actually get on Medicaid and still have the real estate but then they put a lien on the house. And every month as the state pays the nursing home, the lien builds for the amount of money they're paying. And in the meantime, you're in the nursing home, they're taking all your income, so there's nobody to pay the insurance and taxes. So from a, while they let you keep your house in Massachusetts if you're in a nursing home, from a practical standpoint, you're gonna sell it anyway, either way, whether it's Massachusetts or Rhode Island. So that difference to me doesn't, you would still want to go to Rhode Island and, and sell the house and, and deal with that. Because in a minute, I'm going to talk about there's other things that are good in Rhode Island, too, besides that IRA rule. Go ahead. If you get a married couple, if one of them has to go into a nursing home for us permanently, mm -hmm. if that person goes into that Rhode Island nursing home, does that protect in any way the assets of the spouse that's been left behind in Massachusetts? Yes. Well, okay, so... Uh, um, for a married couple, if, if one spouse goes to a nursing home in either state, the, the spouse still, the $2,000 rule, maybe I'll just skip ahead because I think it's on here. Yep, uh, here it is. So the $2,000 rule, that's for a single person. If you're in a nursing home, you can only have $2,000 in your name. Or if, um, both, both spouses are in a nursing home, it'd be the same thing. However, if you're, there's a married couple and one person goes to a nursing home, then the rules are a little bit different because the state doesn't want the spouse who's still living in the community to be just impoverished because of the situation. Of course, there, a lot of money would have to go to the nursing home. The rules are a little bit different. Instead of only being able to keep $2,000, I have the new figure. It changes every year for inflation, but if one's in the nursing home, the other spouse, and this would be the, true in either state, Mass or Rhode Island, can keep $148,620. They can keep $148,620 of assets. So that, again, that goes back to it could be cash in the bank, it could be an investment. It, it, it's just that's the value that they can keep. I have a question on that. Sure. So you said that um, you would be able to you would be able to sell your house, but now that becomes liquid assets. So they still have the rights to that money. We sold our house for four hundred thousand dollars. They're going to take that money before Medicaid kicks in, anyways. Correct. Correct, unless you do something something else. 
So I'm going to I'm going to cover that in a second. Okay. But but I just want to round out the conversation about just in general of married couples. So if you're a married couple, one person's in the nursing home, the spouse can keep $148,620. They can keep a car. So and actually what's funny about that is they don't put a value. So I've had people report like I just had somebody, you know, the husband had like a, you know, whatever, a 55 Corvette and so that was his car. It was a car, so right, they didn't, they didn't question the value because you can have one car of any value. And then the other um, big difference is, going back to your question, if one spouse is in the nursing home, the other spouse can keep the house. And that would be true even in the scenario of one spouse is from a Hobith and goes to Rhode Island. Rhode Island would let the other spouse keep the house in Massachusetts. Um, and then also, just to understand how this all works, we talked about if you go to a nursing home, what they do, there is a, a small amount. I have a sheet that has all the figures, the current figures, but um, if you go to a nursing home, they do let you keep, depending on the state, like around $70 or so of your income, but the rest of the income goes to the nursing home. If it's a married couple, the spouse that's at home can have $2,465 of income. So what do I mean? If you imagine, um, I'll just keep it round numbers, uh, wife has $1,500 of Social Security and husband has $1,500 of Social Security. If husband goes to the nursing home, wife keeps her $1,500, that comes to her, and then she can pull from her husband the difference of $965 to get to that $2,465 figure. So you always keep your own, if you're a married couple, the person always keeps their own income if they're at home, whether it's a pension or social security. But if their own income is less than that $2,465 figure, they can then pull from their spouse who's in the nursing home some of their income to be able to get to that, that threshold, which again, that also changes every year as well. Not by a huge amount, but it goes up every year for inflation. Okay. So, so now we talk about how do we plan for all this. So every, I think everyone's probably, it seems like we have some people who, have, who know a little bit, so that's good. So everybody or most people have probably heard about the five-year rule with Medicaid planning. That's the idea that, okay, so we're, everyone's saying, okay, I've, you know, I've got all these assets. If I go to a nursing home, I'm going to have to pay. I know what I'll do. I'll just give it away. And you can do that. Of course, there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do it. But you can transfer assets. You can give away assets. However, you can't do it the day before you go into a nursing home. It has to be, the transfers have to occur over five years before the date that you apply for Medicaid. Why is that? Because if they didn't have a rule like that, everybody would just give away all their assets as soon as they went to a nursing home. So now we have this, well, we've had it for a long time. It's a five year, called, people call it the five year look back. They, if you apply for Medicaid, they will ask whether or not you made any transfers in the last five years, any gifts. and and it's not just that they ask. They ask for bank statements. They, they go through things and look for large checks and ask what was that for. So uh, it's something that you have to know there's no, there are some things that can be done at the last minute, but to protect most of your assets, it has to be done over five years before you go to a nursing home. So the same thing is true. If you protect your your property, your assets, you know, your home with an irrevocable trust that has to be done, that there's also a five-year look back there also. Correct. Right, so it would be a transfer to a trust, it would be a, a, a gift to a child or some other family member, any transfer mm -hmm. that would uh, cause a disqualification. And what hap happens is, I actually have the numbers on this slide, uh, if you did, let's just say uh, at some point, like three years ago, you helped your grandson buy a car and you gave him $20,000. And that's all you really did. You weren't doing any planning, and you, but that transfer was made. If they see the 20, well, you should report it, but if the $20,000 was transferred three years ago, what they'll say in Massachusetts is, well, the nursing home costs $427 a day. You gave away $20,000 that could have been used to pay the nursing home. So you're disqualified, and then they calculate it, you're disqualified for and I have it, it's $427 a day, so they would just do that math. So I guess, if I, I don't know, I can't do math very well in my head, but $20,000. So if you gave away $20,000 under the current Massachusetts rules, you'd be disqualified for 47 days, okay? 
Rhode Island's a little bit different how they calculate it. They don't, Massachusetts does it on a daily basis where they, they use that 427 a day. Rhode Island actually does it on a monthly basis. So it, Rhode Island, if you, it actually would be, this is something where it would be worse in Rhode Island because in Rhode Island right now it's $10,190 a month. So with that $20,000 example, you actually would be disqualified for three full months because once you go a dollar over that the visor, then you actually get a whole other month that you're disqualified for. That's not something that would really ever factor into whether to go to Massachusetts or Rhode Island, but there actually are a few rules in Rhode Island that are technically a little bit worse than Massachusetts, even though overall Rhode Island rules are much better. And it's funny too to talk about that Rhode Island piece because I do Massachusetts and Rhode Island. A lot of Rhode Island elder law attorneys will refer people from Massachusetts to me and then I end up telling them, well no, we're gonna have you go right back to Rhode, <laughs> Rhode Island. Or, so it's just, it's kind of funny. But it's good knowing both states because you do sometimes have to play with these rules. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about trust in a minute but I want you to know that there are a few things that can be done to protect assets even if there was not trust planning in place ahead of time. In Massachusetts, it's fairly limited. Uh, and I think this goes back to your question. So in Massachusetts, if one spouse went to the nursing home, the other spouse is gonna be able to keep the house, the other spouse is going to be able to keep about $148,000, but everything above that is considered available to, the, to pay the nursing home. The biggest planning technique that's available at this point it's just allowed under the Medicaid rules, is that all the assets in excess of that $148,000 figure can be used to purchase a specific kind of annuity that is allowed by the state. Uh, it's through, it's through uh, a private company like Nationwide. Does, there's only a few companies that do them. Nationwide is one of them. And by taking cash or other assets, liquidating it, turning it all into this Medicaid annuity, the spouse actually can then keep what's above $148,000, except they can't keep it in any form they want. It has to be in an annuity. The annuity is usually set up to be paid out over five years. So if you had, let's say the person had $350,000 and they had to go to a nursing home, or the spouse went to the nursing home, then they would keep the $148,000 or so, and the $200,000 above that would be used to purchase an annuity which then would, it would be just equal payments for five years with interest. They would get paid back the money. So if everything worked the way it was supposed to, they would end up with all the money back in their own name. And nothing, none of it would have gone to the nursing home by doing this annuity. The downside to the annuity, the big downside is while the state allows people to do that, it's, it's not a perfect solution because what the state says is we have a lien on the annuity. So if the spouse in the meantime passes away, the state is going to probably take whatever's left in the annuity. In other words, if they get paid for two years and then get sick and pass away, the state's going to grab whatever's left on the annuity. Go ahead. Is there a limit on the amount of the annuity? No. No, there's not a limit. The, the, um, I have the rules on the slide. It's, it's more that you have to make sure that if it matches the mass health regulations that allow it, uh, which are that the, payment, the payments are equal every month, once you set it up, you can't change it because they don't want people to, doing it, applying for Medicaid, and then undoing it after the fact. Um, for, for older people, the only real issue comes up is if you're, um, I would say like in your, once you get to your 90s, it becomes not necessarily an option because the companies will only do five-year or longer annuities, and the state says that you have to be paid back during your lifetime or your expected lifetime. So they actually have tables. So once you're in your 90s, they say you're not going to statistically live for five years so that it becomes not an option for, for older clients. But um, there's no real limit on how much you could put into the annuity. I should back up. One thing I forgot too, talking about what happens with the assets. Uh, if someone went to a nursing home, in that other example where we say they had $350,000, actually what they would do is keep about 148,000 they would then pay off any debt that they might have. I mean, you can pay off a mortgage or any credit cards, car loans, whatever, that could be paid off. You could prepay your funerals. You could pay a lawyer or an accountant. Then once all that's been paid, and you're sort of like debt free and everything's taken care of, then whatever's left after that would be what would be used for the annuity. 
That's Massachusetts. But now we're going to see why Rhode Island is better. We already talked about in Rhode Island that right off the bat, you don't even have to worry about your IRAs and 401ks. Another interesting thing about Rhode Island is we saw in Massachusetts that you can do an annuity, but the state has a lien on the annuity. In Rhode Island, if you're a married couple, one person goes to the nursing home, the other person can actually loan to a child or other family member all their assets. So take that same example. They could take the $200,000 and loan it to a child. Here, it's a three, I do a three-page promissory note. They write a check to the child. Here's $200,000. The spouse in the nursing home gets on Medicaid. The child has to pay back the loan, and they will. Hopefully, but that's the really risk. They hope they will. <laughs> but the child actually then just pays back the loan over, say, in that example, maybe two years, and the and the spouse at home gets all their money back. They don't have a lien from this on an annuity like they do in Massachusetts. They don't have to deal with a financial company and the costs associated with paying for a commercial annuity. It's all just done with a family member, and they can actually protect all their assets by doing the the loan. Go ahead. Spouse that's uh, not in the nursing home can still be in Massachusetts during all this that you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Yep. Believe it or not, they can. Yep. I mean, this goes back decades, but there were cases back when people were moving between states and states tried to uh, restrict. They said, well, you haven't been a resident of here long enough to be able to apply for Medicaid. And it's, <laughs> it's a right to travel constitutional issue where states can't prohibit people from moving to their state. So. Um, you can, you can never have paid a dime in taxes in, your, in Rhode Island your entire life, but still do this. Move, have the spouse go to a Rhode Island nursing home and take advantage of all these rules. And of course, what's the, the result is, is that Rhode Island taxpayers are paying now for the spouse in the nursing home's long-term care. But that's just, that, that's the rules. I mean, these, and part of this is, I would say, you know, Massachusetts, the rules in Massachusetts are the actual federal law. So Medicaid, it's a federal program, and then each state, handles it how they want. So what Massachusetts does is actually what the federal law says. But there, the way the law works is there's nothing stopping the state from being more generous. So Rhode Island, I'm not sure if there's, what, why, I'm not even sure if they necessarily realize what they're doing, but they're, they allow this other stuff to take place, even though technically they don't have to. So it's, it's a, again, it's a good benefit for people in Bristol County, Massachusetts, because it's so close to go to Rhode Island. I have a lot of clients who, uh, you know, unfortunately, if someone gets sick, and depending on where they live, like in Seekonk or even parts of Rehoboth and Swansea, they end up going to Rhode Island Hospital or somewhere in Providence. And then without even talking to me, they end up going to a Rhode Island nursing home just because then once you're in a hospital in that state, they usually will send people to a nursing home in that state. So I've had people come in not even knowing anything about these rules, and the spouse was already in Rhode Island just coincidentally because of how things played out. Um, so we talked about, so one other thing about Rhode Island, it gets even better, I suppose, is we talked about a married couple, I could save everything for a married couple. If one person goes to the nursing home in Rhode Island and the other person is at home, we could save everything. It's not as good if you're a single person because there's a little bit less options, but even st then, there's still options. In Massachusetts, if a single person goes to a nursing home, other than paying off the debt and paying for a funeral, there's really not much they can do to protect the assets that are remaining. In Rhode Island, even a single person, they allow a single person, the day they're in the nursing home, to give away half of their assets. And, right, and then they loan the other half of their assets to the child, kind of like what we talked about before. The, the child will pay back the loan over several months, however much money there is, but then once the loan's paid back, the state then starts paying the nursing home bill and they don't question the, the fact that half of the elders' assets were gifted away, even though they were already in a nursing home, even though there was no five-year look back that they had gotten through. So again, another huge benefit in, in Rhode Island. Um, does anyone have any other questions? So that's what we call crisis planning. That's, what that means is there wasn't any planning in advance, so you're trying to do the best you can with the situation in front of you. Uh, for, I would say, you know, generally, a married couple in Rhode Island ends up working out pretty well, but then for a single person in Rhode Island or a single or married couple in uh, Massachusetts, you can protect, as you saw from all those examples, you can protect some, but not everything. 
in the, in the last minute crisis scenario. But does anyone have any other questions about that? Okay, so then how do you avoid even getting into that sort of scenario, right, of, of last minute move, which is, it's a stressful scenario anyway, just given what's going on, but then to have to be closing accounts and liquidating assets and changing things, it's stressful. So another way to deal with this, and this, again, this is probably, other than just doing basic estate planning for people, I, I think for most, like self-included, for most estate planning attorneys, this now has become the most popular um, enhanced area of estate planning, which is irrevocable Medicaid trusts. And what these are, are the, the goal here is that you create a trust or trust, depending on the, what the assets, and you're moving them out of your name so that after five years, if you had to go to a nursing home, they're protected, they're through the five-year look back. But it's structured in a way to give you the most control and tax benefits as possible. Like it's a balancing act between protecting things but still keeping things as close to what they were before you set it all up. So with an irrevocable Medicaid trust, which is different than a tax trust, uh, while they don't have to be, you can actually be your own trustee. Of your, you don't have to be, but you can be your own trustee of your irrevocable trust. While it's irrevocable, it says that you can make certain changes, the primary one being that you can change beneficiaries. So if you have an irrevocable Medicaid trust, and it, it sounds scary because it's irrevocable, but you put uh, in three kids' names and then something happens where you have a falling out with somebody and you wanna change it, you can do that with an irrevocable Medicaid trust. It's um, set up in a way where if you put real estate into it, you still have the right to live there. If you put a rental property into it, you still have the right to the rent. So you still can have the benefits of the, of the assets that are in there. If you put an investment, you can still get the interest and dividends. And people say, well, well you know, why would I do this? Because it's the, the, the most flexible way to protect things from the nursing home. Because the alternative, if you want to protect things from the nursing home, would be you know, writing checks to kids or um, something, which some people do, a life estate deed where you deed the property to your kids and keep the right to live there. But those other alternatives, other than an irrevocable trust, have some risk because the kids or whoever you're doing this for are going to become the owners. So while you might trust your kids, and then maybe the kids are fine, they're married, so if they get divorced, that could be a problem because the asset's in their name. If they have a creditor problem or file for bankruptcy, same thing, the assets are in their name. So the idea why people do an irrevocable trust is it gets it out of their own name, so it's protected from the nursing home, but it's not yet in whoever they're leaving it to's name either. It's, it's like suspended between the two. So in case something happens with the child or whoever they're setting it up for, grandchildren or nieces and nephews, they can always pull it back or change things while they're living to protect the assets, but to protect themselves as well. So that, you know, I've seen it before. People, unfortunately, with life estate deeds, their child doesn't think or doesn't know, and files for bankruptcy, and then there's liens on the, the house because, the parent's house, because they didn't, they own the house. The kid owns the house. It's their asset. Um, so that's why we would, most attorneys now would say do an irrevocable Medicaid trust. And now it is irrevocable for Medicaid purposes, but unlike a tax trust, it's still yours for income tax purposes, which means, um, I think probably the biggest thing people are concerned about, if you put your primary residence into an irrevocable Medicaid trust and sell it, you still get a principal residence exclusion. That, that 250, you know, people heard of that. If you sell your house, a you, certain amount of capital gain is not taxed. You would still get that even though it's in an irrevocable Medicaid trust. Any abatements that you might have for property taxes would still carry through with an irrevocable Medicaid trust. And then for tax purpose, estate tax purposes, it's still yours for estate tax purposes because most people who are doing this are not, you know, we just talked about the figures, you know, over $2 million or $4 million. Well, if you're in that range, you're probably not even doing this kind of planning. But for people who are under $2 million in assets, they actually want it to be theirs for estate tax purposes because they don't have to pay estate taxes anyway. But you get what's called a step up in basis, which means that, uh, if you bought a property for $200,000 and then when you die, it's worth 400, with this kind of trust, and this would be the same if it was just in your name, but with this kind of trust, if you die and the kids go to sell the house, their starting point for capital gains is the 400,000, the value of the day you died, not the, the amount you paid for it. So it, 
So for tax, it's intentionally set up this way so that you don't lose any tax benefit that you have as an individual that carries through with this kind of trust. Does anyone have questions about? Go ahead. Question on the uh, uh, trust, irrevocable trust. The scenario is that you, you fund it with your, your real estate, okay? And you put, say, a, uh, a quarter of a million dollars in it also because you want to protect it. You said that you can protect some, uh, some uh, uh, investments in the irrevocable Medicaid trust and real estate. You have a, your child as the trustee of the account. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to buy a car. Now, your child owns that quarter of a million dollars that you protected in that irrevocable trust. Uh, the car is thirty thousand dollars. Can your child give you a check because he owns that account now to buy that car? And if so, what happens? How is that thirty thousand dollars looked at in the eyes of the state? Okay, so that's a good question. So, generally speaking, and maybe this would be a, a good way to describe it. Uh, generally, when you set up irrevocable trust, you don't put every every last cent in. The analysis would be: What assets do I think I need? And what assets do I think I'm never going to touch, or I don't plan on touching them? It's usually those assets that go into the irrevocable trust. Because why would you, if you put everything in, you don't want to put everything in and then say, oh, wait a minute, now I can't live, right? So you, you sort of look at your assets, and that's something that an attorney helps with, is decide which assets go into an irrevocable trust, which assets stay in your own name or in a revocable trust. But if assets are in an irrevocable trust, and down the line you said, oh, you know what, I put too much in there, I need the... I need $30,000 for a car. The trust, you're not a direct beneficiary, but someone is, uh, whether it's kids or grandkids, somebody is the beneficiary of the trust. The trust can make a dish, of course, this is the part we may want to turn off the camera, I don't know, but <laughs> if the trust can, what people do, the trust can make a distribution to one of your children or whoever the beneficiary is. So let's say it's the $30,000. $30,000 can come out of the trust to that child they put it in their bank account, it's theirs. There's nothing then at that point legally stopping them from turning around and writing you a check for $30,000. But does, does that appear as a gift to the child later on in his income tax? Well, gifts aren't tax, They're, gifts aren't income. Okay. So there was, there's no real tax ramification. Okay. What I tell clients is, it was already yours for tax purposes, so the fact that it went to the child and then immediately back to you, the IRS would say that wasn't, from the tax perspective, that's not, even, that's not anything. It's, a gift and a gift back, it's a wash. So it disappears. Disappear. Well, right, that's true. Um, but it's, what's important to know is you have to follow, if you have a trust, and this is something that Mass Health really, they're tough about. If you have a trust, you have to follow the mechanics of the trust. So if you ever wanted to get the $30,000 out, you cannot go to the bank and pull out the $30,000. You would have to have it go from the trust to the child, because that's what the trust says can happen and then the child gives you the, the check back. It's, they've sort of mellowed out, but about 10 years or so ago, Mass Health was heavily scrutinizing irrevocable trusts, and one of the big dings on people when they had these trusts was while the documents were fine, they were doing all kinds of things that didn't follow the documents. So in that scenario, if they had been taking out every year $30,000, and then they went to apply for Mass Health, Mass Health said, well, wait a minute. You've been, this trust says you can't take any money, and you've been taking $30,000 out every year. You didn't follow the terms, so everything's available. So one thing about the trust is to be very careful if you have these kinds of trusts to follow the terms of the trust. One of the worst things I see as a lawyer is people set up these trusts for like say their house, and then they sell their house, and the closing attorney gives them a check in their own name and they put it in their own bank account. I mean, they could have had the trust for 15 years. It was, the house was protected, but by putting the check in their own personal name after the sale, they've completely blown up any planning that they had. So what I tell clients is don't do anything without telling me. <laughs> so, and, and usually that, that works, but it's usually when they don't call me that something like that happens. Go ahead, sure. No, no, because... <laughs> A lot of lawyers don't understand this stuff. I mean, it's, we all, nowadays, all areas of the law, everybody has their specialty. So it is, it is confusing. It is complicated. Um, but, sure. Um, 
someone who I know who does uh, income taxes. Mm -hmm. She was saying that if you took the money and put it into a trust and had a checking account for the trust, you technically still have control of the money. You're just writing checks from the trust. Mm -hmm. Is I, that considered an irrevocable or is that irrevocable? It could be either. Okay. Okay. So in that case, if he needed $30,000 and he's in charge of the checking account, he can make himself a check for $30,000. No. See, if you... Um, okay, a good example would be if you had a rental property in an irrevocable trust. You'd have the real estate and probably a checking account. And you would be the trustee of the... Right? And so you would collect the rents and put them in the checking account. You would pay all you know, the bills and all, all the expenses related to the rental property. You actually could take the, the income, but let's say there was other money in that account. You can't just pull out the $30,000 because the trust says you're allowed, you're allowed to pay for things, but you can't, you can't directly benefit from it. So you can cover all the expenses, but what's left is there, either it stays in the trust or it can be distributed to one of the beneficiaries who cannot be you or your spouse. Because if you and your spouse are beneficiaries, then it's almost pointless. You could. So, okay, so does that, that sort of help? Okay. If you take the irrevocable stuff and you take something out of it legally, mm -hmm. does it, the look back become five years again or does it stay where it is? Stays where it is. The look back, now what's important about the look back though is the look back starts when an asset goes into the trust. Right. So. If you take some of the asset out, it doesn't change? Right, it doesn't change, no. No, but, uh, but the idea that an asset, the five year clock starts when an asset goes in, People sign a trust and the date of the trust is right there the day they signed. But if they wait a year to put something in, that's when the five-year clock starts. It's not the day the trust was created, it's the day the asset goes into the trust, okay? But as long as the, the trust terms are followed and the money doesn't go directly to the person but to their beneficiary, and then whatever they do afterward, that's fine, then it's, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Okay, um, just real quick on this. I mean, this is almost probably too complicated for today, but there is another kind of trust that we do in very rare situations because there's a five year, the kind of trust I was talking about, an irrevocable Medicaid trust, is what uh, a lawyer would call an inter vivos trust, or it's a trust created during life. It's something that you make while you're living, it, it exists, it, assets are owned by it. There's also something called a testamentary trust, which is a testamentary meaning it's a trust in your will, your last will and testament. And once in a while, there's a, there are situations where you have somebody, maybe um, one spouse whose health is failing and the other spouse who maybe need to go to a nursing home. In those situations, you actually can put everything into the spouse who's failing's name and they have a will that says they're not leaving everything to the, the other spouse, but instead it's gonna be going to a trust by doing that, you actually can completely avoid the five-year clock. But that's, not, that's just something to know. It's not something that anyone should ever rely on because it really depends on a very specific situation where one person's in bad health and the other person has to go to a nursing home. Uh, then you might use that kind of planning. Go ahead. Sure. It's very weird that happens. But in case both of us die in a car accident, okay. something like that. So what leaves us, that's to our kids? on that trust that you're talking about, on that uh, workable trust. Yeah, that, that I, don't, I didn't understand because our, my, our English, my husband and I of ourselves is not the best of those words sometimes to explain it to it. So certain things we lost, we don't understand. And I was hearing all these questions and, you know, and answers, but we did talk like, I mean, we talk, we've been talking like if one stays, the other one goes to the nursing home, but like, if we do a trust, you know, for example, for, for us to understand, I'm going to talk about for both of us to understand about it. Like, if we do a trust, we have two kids. You know, one lives in Rhode Island, one lives in us. But it doesn't matter in that situation, as I, I heard. But if, uh, you know, what we could do, like, so the nursing home, if we do a trust right now, we don't have that kind of $2 million of that kind of money you're talking about. But if something happens to us, we'll go directly to our kids. So this way, the, the nursing home doesn't touch, touch that money? Well, with a trust, if, so there's two different 
scenario. So with a trust, whether it's revocable or irrevocable, if you both died in a car accident, you'd, you'd avoid probate. It would go automatically to your kids. The reason for the irrevocable trust would be that it not only avoids probate, but if you got sick and had to go to a nursing home, the, whatever's in the trust would be protected from the nursing home. So the nursing home won't touch whatever it's, it's there. Right. Okay. For example, the home or in, you know, that's a medical around or Massachusetts, they, they can't touch there. Right. Okay. So that's, that's, now we understand a little better because what it is, what I was, I was getting confused, we were both getting confused about it, you know, but doing all this, spend this kind of money to do, you know, the, the trust. And they still have to go in and touch it, you know what I mean? And one more thing, if we do that trust, for example, this is this example, we, we make it to our kids, but we have grandkids. If we don't want their spouses to get it, we can make, for example, something happened to my son has kids, my daughter does not have kids, but if it happens to my kids, I mean, for example, for my son, can go directly to his kids, mm -hmm. not to his spouse. Right. All the reverse side, my daughter doesn't have kids. If something happened to her, it could go to their nephew, I mean, to my grandkids. Mm -hmm. we, we can do that too, no? Right, a trust, that, and that could be done in a will or a trust, but, but in all these documents, you would say what you want to have happen to your assets when you pass away. So what's and, and the you, best on those, either the trust or the will? Because the will is cheaper than the trust. The will, right, <laughs> yeah, so that's true. The, it's it's simpler and... Between one and the other. It, it's, it's, it depends on the situation. Some people, you know, it, it, it depends on what the goals are, but some people only need wills. And the, the, the big downside for only having a will is probate. But that's not, personally, that's not the end of the world to have probate. Um, usually the reason to do trust is because you want to protect things from the nursing home or maybe there's somebody in the family who you have a concern. I'm going to talk a minute about special needs trust, but there's a concern in uh, the family about somebody's on disability or, or has special needs. Somebody has a creditor problem. You're worried, you want to leave something to them, but you know that someone else might try to get it or they maybe can't handle it themselves. So. But in like a more cookie cutter situation of a married couple and two kids, maybe all you need is a will. It, it may be that that's all you need. Uh, something that when you sit down with a will, for example, if you sit down private, that you can see what's the best Exactly, way right. To, to do it. Right, because it goes back to what I said earlier on, but it's, there's no one size fits all. It all depends on a lot of things, age and health, assets, like the value of assets, the type of assets, what the wishes are. I mean, some people, we talk about this Medicaid planning, there's other people who would say, which is perfectly reasonable, if I get sick, it's my money, I'll pay the nursing home and they'll get what's left. I mean, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable position to take. So I'm just kind of laying out all the different tools that exist, but, but what someone does would depend on their own situation. I'm sorry, okay. I, just, I had to talk this way so I can understand more or less what you're talking about, you know what I mean? So right. we're, we're a little lost, you know what I mean? Because you, you talk with friends that has that, you, you hear so many things about it, but yeah. you, know, you never know because so, every accent is different, you know? Right. right. I, I always don't, you, it's fine to talk to other people, you hear things on the radio, but unless you, you meet with someone and, and go through your own situation, you're not gonna know for sure what, what you should do. You don't know what's going, when you talk to somebody else you know, you don't know what's going on in their life, what their assets are or, or anything. So it's hard to, there's no one size fits all. It's hard to say that you have to do one thing or another. Go ahead. Yep. In a very simplified way, I've always looked at a, a trust as paying probate in advance. That's true. I, I say that to people, I have almost the same thing. That's what it is. It costs, but it avoids similar or more costs for the beneficiaries. Correct, so. correct, which is why for me, if people do not have the tax issues, they're not concerned about the nursing home, it, it's really like, well, you could just do a will then. I mean, it, it, it's pay now or pay later. That's all a revocable trust does, is just avoids probate. Um, so it's, it's definitely reasonable when, I mean, when I meet with clients, if they say they don't want to do a, re if they have, they don't have the other concerns, then if they say all they want to do is a will, that's a perfectly rational decision to make to say, 
My kids, you know, they'll just do probate. It, one thing that's worse in Rhode Island, probate is definitely worse in Rhode Island than Massachusetts because in Massachusetts, they modernize the system. It's all done through the mail. It's simpler in Massachusetts. In Rhode Island, so in Massachusetts, probate is by county. So there's a courthouse in Taunton and there's one in Fall River, but everything is just done through the mail. In Rhode Island, probate is done by town and every town has its own judge. And they meet, depending on the town, they meet a lot of them once a month and, a lawyer, and your lawyer has to go to the court when they want to do, do things. And it's, so, it, so the, same, you know, the same assets, same person in Massachusetts versus Rhode Island, it's much, it is much more expensive in Rhode Island just because of the way they handle probate. But probate in Massachusetts, as long as there are no issues like creditors or whatever else, if everyone gets along and there's no problems, probate actually is fairly, a fairly seamless process now in Massachusetts. It has been for a little over 10 years when they changed the laws around. So, sure. Um, if you have, let's say, that a, a substantial part of your, your assets are an IRA. Now, does the federal government ever get involved here with any of this other stuff you're talking about and saying, you know, we don't want this to continue just like with RMDs every, every year? Could they force anything? Do you know what I mean? In what, in what context? <laughs> um, well, let, let's say you have uh, non-spousal beneficiaries of your IRAs, mm -hmm. which I know is now limited to 10 years. But, does, but if you're involved before that in, in any kind of expenses, does the federal government ever say, we, you, can't, you can't do it in 10 years now because you have to do it earlier, maybe I'm not making sense. Uh, no, that there are, well, you're right. So for, if we're talking about IRAs, you're right that if it's not a spouse, there's a few other exceptions, but generally speaking for most people, if you have an IRA now and you pass away, your kids or whoever is gonna have to take out that money over the course of 10 years. Um, if you have an estate, it's actually, but you wouldn't do that. It's different rules if you have an estate named as a beneficiary or, But, to a home, oh, okay, right. That's what I'm wondering. Like, is, and you're talking about being able to transfer things and all. If the IRS wants their well, money. well, that goes. That's true. So it's not that the okay. I understand now. So the the government's not going to, the federal government doesn't get involved. The tax rules are the tax rules. But in that scenario in Massachusetts, because the Medicaid Mass Health views an IRA the equivalent of cash. You have to, you're going, you're taking out even more than your RMD. You're going to take out the $10,000 a month or whatever it is every month. And that would be taxable income as you're doing it. Um, the flip side, though, would be if you're using it for medical expenses, there'd be a medical deduction. So maybe it wouldn't really be a big tax hit. But the, the tax rules are just the tax rules. All this, most of what I'm talking about today really is on the state level. How, how you know, whether you would do certain things or not do certain things. Okay. I mean, technically all of these laws come from the federal government and then the state carry, each state carries them out. So a, a change could someday occur. The last time they changed the rules for Medicaid was in 2006. So a, a change could occur, or 2005, uh, could occur again in the future. But right now Congress, they just, how long did it take them to get a Speaker of the House? So I don't really know how, <laughs> if we're gonna have, <laughs> have any major changes to these rules anytime soon on the federal side. Um, one thing I want to touch on for the, for anyone who's, uh, spending time in Florida, you know, we talked a lot about Massachusetts and Rhode Island. In my experience, a lot of people from this area who decide to become Florida residents do that. But if down the line, they need long-term care, usually like they, like their kids are up here, families up here. So while they may be Florida residents for, a, uh, some period of time, if they, if they get sick, they, they tend to come back to Massachusetts because that's where their doctors are, that's where their family is. Um, I mean, I don't know if anyone hears of Snowbird, but I'm sure if you talk to your Snowbird friends, they probably, their doctors are probably here. And, and a, lot of, you know, a lot of their people are still up here even if they became Florida residents on paper. So to that point, this kind of planning 
still should be done for people in Florida who, who, are, who are splitting their time because what's going to determine the rules that apply to you are the rules of the state the nursing home is in. Going back to that whole thing, if you go to a Rhode Island nursing home, you're subject to the Rhode Island rules. If you go to a Massachusetts nursing home, you're subject to the Massachusetts rules. The problem I see as a Florida lawyer that does this stuff is in Florida, under Florida law, your house is protected from the nursing home. People in Florida don't have to do irrevocable trust because the state constitution says that your homestead which, you know, we have a homestead in Massachusetts that protects you from different kinds of creditors. One exception is the government. In, in Florida, it, right, in Florida, it protects you from the government as well. So when people go to lawyers in Florida and they say, hey, I've got my house in Florida and I've got, you know, $200,000 in the bank, a Florida lawyer would say, okay, well, your house is protected under Florida law and they don't do anything. They might do a will. But the problem with that analysis is that only works if they stay in Florida. If they come back to Massachusetts, their house now, under the Medicaid rules, is a vacation home. It's a second home. So it, it won't be protected if they need long-term care up here. So I still have my Florida clients, even though they're Florida residents, do this kind of planning because you don't know, what, you know where you might end up. Uh, so just to cover all bases. Okay. Let's see what time. Okay, I don't want to go too long. I'm going to, I'll, I'm just going to pass through the next section, which is special needs planning. This is a more specific type of planning that would apply for anyone who has a family member that's on, on benefits of some kind, whether it's, now it would be need-based benefits, so the kind of benefits where they can only have a certain amount of money in their own name. Examples would be SSI, uh, Medicaid, also like Section 8 housing would be another example, so any kind of need-based benefits. Those people, you know, if you have a child or a family member that's in that situation and you want to leave something to them, the worst thing that you could do is leave it to them directly because if you do and they inherit whatever it is, $50,000, $100,000, now they have a problem because they're not supposed to have that much money and they, you know, could jeopardize their benefits. So, and I don't want to sp spend too much time on it because I, I want to respect everyone's time, but just to sort of run through things, there's generally speaking, a few different kinds of special needs trusts, because that, that term special needs trust is sort of a blanket term. There's actually different types of them. So the first kind of special needs trust is what a lot of people would call a supplemental needs trust, and what that's sort of like when you plan ahead. So if you know that uh, there's someone in your family that you want to leave something to, and they're on benefits, or they could be on benefits. Maybe they're not right now, but the potential's there. When you do your estate plan, you don't want to just leave things to them directly. Instead, you would structure the estate plan to have an ongoing trust for them called a supplemental needs trust. And in that, you would set it up yourself. So you would name who you would want to be their trustee, who would be in charge of the money. That person would then be able to pay for extra things beyond the basics like food and housing. They could pay for vacations, for computers, for a car. Whatever they, the disabled person needed, this trustee could pay for that for them. And by having that structure in place ahead of time, you avoid the potential of, okay, everything goes into their name and now they're over assets and now they're gonna lose their benefits. So it's just something that needs to be, you know, when you have that, I always ask clients, it's on my questionnaire, if there's anybody who's in their family on disability because you don't wanna have them leave things to that person and then have their benefits be jeopardized. That's a supplemental needs trust. Now, there is a workaround. It's, now this is, kind of makes you think about what we talked about before with annuities and other things. There is a workaround if planning was not put in place ahead of time. So for instance, if, um, you know, like I just had this happen in my office. Grandmother had a trust that was 20 years old, left everything to her daughter, but then the daughter died, and then in the meantime, the son's on disability. So everything's going to the son through the grandmother's estate plan, but, she didn't know 20 years earlier that her daughter was going to pass away and, and then that the son, who was probably a little kid at the time, would be on disability. So the way the estate plan is set up on paper, it's all for the son who's on disability. If he doesn't do anything about it and just accepts the inheritance, he's gonna lose his benefits. What can be done as like a quick fix, last minute, you know, last ditch effort, I guess, it works fine, but it's, it's something that has to be done now is the same, Generally speaking, the same type of trust can be set up after the fact, and, the, and a trustee can be named, and they'll hold the funds for the disabled person, make distributions for them. But while the federal law allows that to happen, the big downside is that 
if there's any money left in the trust when the disabled person dies, the state has a lien on that. So that's the trade-off. They let people create trusts in that scenario, but the, the trade-off is there's gonna be a lien on the property that's left. What I tell people is make sure you spend it all, but that may or may not be realistic. So um, that's, the, that's the one other kind of trust that you can set up. I mean, these are very, again, these could all be tailored for different situations, but just broadly speaking, there's the supplemental needs trust that is, if you plan ahead, and there won't be a lien. So in other words, with that trust, if you compare it, if you said I'm gonna leave a third of my assets to my son who's on disability, that money would be there for him and used for him, but if he died, then your trust would say who would get it, whatever's left, and it would go to whoever you name, whether it's his children, siblings, whatever. With the other trust, this D4A trust, where there wasn't planning in place, when the disabled person dies, whatever's left is gonna to go to the state. So planning ahead versus sort of like a last minute fix. There are also, now these would not be documents you create with an attorney, but instead there's also something called a pooled trust, which is an option in certain scenarios where people either don't have a trustee, like a family member who could be the trustee for the disabled beneficiary, or um, maybe there's just, I've, I've had this happen, somebody comes into like maybe a relatively smaller amount of money, $5,000, $10,000, where why would you pay for a trust? It's gonna, you know, it's gonna eat up so much of it and it's not gonna be a long-term issue. There are charities, nonprofits, that administer things called pool trusts, which are actually a, an organization that has this global trust and you can actually go and open an account for this extra money that you've come into or that a parent wants to leave to somebody. And there's about a dozen or so in Massachusetts. In Rhode Island, there's two of them. One is uh, the plan of Massachusetts in Rhode Island and it's based in Pawtucket. And then the other one is called the Rhode Island Pool Trust that is in Warwick. So these are some options that exist as well. If creating a separate standalone trust doesn't exist, you could always do a pool trust. The one there, the Rhode Island Pool Trust, I helped create. So I actually um, now sort of on like a pro bono basis, I help them out when they have issues. But it's nice because it just gives people who, for one reason or another, wouldn't want their own trust another option. That really doesn't cost anything. Okay. So I already gave all of these figures. This is the, the current thresholds for federal Massachusetts and Rhode Island estate taxes. You can see, I mean, this is why it's become such a non-issue for most people. I mean, on the federal side, we're up almost to um, $13 million before you have to pay federal estate taxes. And for a married couple, that's almost $26 million. Massachusetts with the law change, it's now $2 million, which is interesting. They actually made the law change retroactive to the beginning of this year. So I have some clients whose parents passed away and we filed an estate tax return and paid estate taxes because let's say they had like 1.5 million. And now that they've changed the law, now they're gonna get a refund because the law, they died to say in March and it's retroactive to January 1st. So now they have to send people checks because of the change in the law. So, but now we're at 2 million. And then again, Rhode Island, it's adjusted for inflation. There's already talk because it's, they're now Rhode Island's worse than Massachusetts that they don't wanna be worse than Massachusetts that that could be going up to like two and a half or three million, so we'll see. But, but on this side, you know, with estate taxes, there's not much better about going to Rhode Island or Massachusetts on this one. It's, uh, either way, it's about the same. And like I said, the only state worse now than these two is Oregon. Of course, then you get into Florida and a lot of, you know, the southern states where there's no estate tax at all uh, or gift tax or why a lot of people like to go to this, a lot of these other states, no income tax. Um, I don't know, is anyone, he, anyone here, I know that there's some Florida people that might watch the video afterward. Is anyone here a Florida part-timer? No, you, you'd be gone by now if you were, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll, what's that? I know, I know. <laughs> I, do, I am gonna just cover this because I think a few people that are in Florida will be interested, um, even though I know in the room you're probably not all that interested, but just to kind of go over it, multi-state estate planning. So this is what I call the planning I do for people who are from Massachusetts or Rhode Island who also have a place in Florida. Um, in those situations, in my experience, most people, if they're gonna have, be part-time in both states, at that point they decide they wanna become Florida residents why? Because there's no income tax, state income tax in Florida. There's no estate tax in Florida. Um, 
Also, in Florida, if it's your primary residence, you have lower property taxes than if it's a second home. So all those tax reasons motivate people to become, if they're going, you know, it's not something, you don't move somewhere because of taxes, but if you've already bought a place and that's where you're spending a lot of time, it usually makes sense at that point to make Florida your primary residence because of the, the tax benefits that come along with that. Um, oh, and then how would you become a Florida resident? Or then this would apply for any state. I mean, the one New England state where similar rules exist is New Hampshire, although I don't know, I mean, it's colder there than it is here, but there are, I've heard of people, I mean, I know lawyers up north of Boston who have clients who have now, because of the differences in the tax laws, they've decided, well, I'm just gonna, it's kind of like we talked about going a couple towns over for nursing homes, they're going a couple towns over for retirement because by moving to Southern New Hampshire, they're now not paying income tax and in estate taxes. So, uh, you know, depending on the scenario, it does make sense. And how do you change residency? You have to have two things that you have to be able to show. One, that you actually have a place that you live. So I've had people call me and say, or try to tell me, well, I'm gonna get a PO box in Florida. Well, you know, that doesn't work. You actually have to have some dwelling place, whether you own a house or a condo or, or even rent, but you have to live somewhere in Florida. You can't just have an address. And then, and then beyond that, I mean, that's the easy part, having a place to live. Beyond that, you then have to update everything about your life to make Florida or wherever else it's going to be your primary residence. So what does that mean? It means, uh, and for some people I know that they, this is hard for people that are born and raised in Massachusetts, but you know, things like changing their driver's license and changing where they vote, uh, really just making that place in Florida their primary residence on paper. So their bills would go there, bank account statements. You would never list your vacation home on your, on your bank accounts as your address. So in the same way, if you're trying to become a resident of a state other than Massachusetts, you wanna make that other state uh, the, the address that's listed on everything. Why, are we do, why would you do all of this? Who would care? Florida doesn't care if you become a Florida resident or not. And the feds don't care because you still live in the US. But you're, you would be doing all of this because you would want to avoid down the line either the Massachusetts Department of Revenue or the Rhode Island Division of Taxation, either way, they work the same way, from trying to argue that, well, wait a minute, you're in Massachusetts and you're in Florida, are you really a Florida resident? And because what they want is the 5% income tax, right? So you want to do everything you can to make Florida, or and I keep saying Florida, but any, the other state, the primary residence, and Massachusetts or Rhode Island, the, the second home. Some people say you have to be there six months in a day. That's not technically the rule, although I would tell people you should be in the other state more than you're in this state. Because why? You know, this is your second home, so you should be the other place more. But if you go on a cruise or you visit your grandkids somewhere, those weeks don't count, and just look at trying to be at least somewhat more in the other state than you are in this state. One thing that gets people tripped up though is when they become Florida residents, they, they don't necessarily do planning that, that takes care of what's going on up here. So I already talked about the Medicaid issue that down in Florida, elder law attorneys will tell people your house is protected under Florida law, but that doesn't apply if you come back to Massachusetts. In the same way with taxes, estate taxes, if you become a Florida resident but own real estate in Massachusetts, you're still subject to the Massachusetts estate tax. Um, sort of similar, if you become a Florida resident, this would be a time when, okay, we talked about probate. Uh, if you become a Florida resident and you have a house in Florida and a house in Massachusetts, that would be a time I would tell someone, well, you probably should have a trust because the what probate goes by state. So if you have real estate in multiple states, there has to be probate in each one of those states. So while one probate maybe isn't the end of the world, having to do two, or I've had clients you know, in this area, three, right? Because they have a, they have a house and they live in Massachusetts, have a rental in Rhode Island, and they have a vacation home in Florida. With just a will, they have to, their kids have to do probate in three states. So that would be a time where, if, once you get into the multi-state stuff, usually a trust is the way to go for different reasons. Um, for estate taxes, you know, one reason would be Again, because, the, because Massachusetts will still tax you if you have real estate here, depending on the scenario, what we'll do is put it into a trust or a, a limited liability company because the tax law only applies to real estate you own. So if it's a trust structured the right way or you put your property into an LLC and you 
are a resident of Florida, now you don't own real estate in Massachusetts. You might have a beneficial interest in a trust or you might have uh, ownership of a company, but it's not pure real estate. And that actually is a way to get around the Massachusetts estate tax when you're a resident of Florida, but still have real estate up here. It's all legal. It's not, you know, just how just the law. You know, they write the laws and then lawyers figure out ways to get around them. That's, <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> um, so that sort of rounds out the overview. Okay, okay on time. So hopefully, I don't know, hopefully your heads aren't spinning. I know that's a lot to digest. <laughs> But I did put in the materials, there's a copy of the slides and then sort of like a one page fact sheet of all those key figures. And also we do a newsletter at our office. We do a, both a quarterly estate planning newsletter and a quarterly elder law newsletter. So I put the fall versions of that in there just to see what those are like. Usually the topics are a little, they're a little lighter and more just different topics of interest. But um, if anyone wanted to start getting that, you could just email me, my card's there, we can put you on the list. Um, but hopefully that, I don't know, hopefully you walked away with a little bit more information, although if you, if you ever want to talk to me about any of it, you know, I don't charge for consultations, so it's, if there's something on your mind, we could, I could stay after, we could talk about it, or you could just always schedule a, a meeting or a call, because I am just less than 10 minutes from here, so it's pretty easy to get to. But does anyone have any questions now after all that they want to ask? Hey, uh, I know it's not the state plan, but umbrella policies on your insurance and the Homestead Act, if you live in Massachusetts? Uh, well, I think you should have both in an ideal yeah, world. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. We didn't talk, I'm glad you brought that up because that wasn't in my slides, but Homestead. So everyone here, if you don't have it already, you should, uh, is the a Homestead on your primary residence. What that does, it, it will, I think in this, um, at this point, most people, if you bought your house in the last 10 years or so, they probably brought it up at the closing that you should have a Homestead and hopefully you just did it then. But before that, this didn't really come up when people bought houses, but by having a, a homestead, your house would be protected in case you got sued. This, now this, again, this wouldn't protect you from a nursing home, but it would protect you from a third party, like if you got in a car accident or, or something, they tried to go after your house, the homestead would protect you from that. And then on top of that, you, um, you mentioned umbrella insurance. That's another good thing to have for liability protection. Again, from a creditor, well not from a creditor, but from a, a lawsuit, um, it would, if you get in a car accident, your auto insurance covers you to a certain extent. If you have an umbrella policy, that would go beyond the auto insurance. It'd also go beyond your homeowner's insurance. It's usually fairly inexpensive. If you call your insurance broker, you get a million or $2 million in coverage for maybe a couple hundred dollars a year. But those are good things to have for, for liability protection. The homestead is just a form that gets filed for you. It would get filed at the Taunton Registry of Deeds because where Hobeth goes to Taunton. Um, it's a, it's a two-page form, it costs $35, but gives you great protection from a lawsuit. So those are things to have beyond, I guess that would fall into the basics, beyond having a will and a healthcare proxy and power attorney, you should also have a homestead, right? Any, any other ones? No?